I love when parents are very proactive and they're like, I want to learn more about this first and see what it entails. So good for you. Thank you. And someone else just uh, joined Sydney, did they? Yep. Looks like. Didn't see them. We have a, a Mr. Humbeat asking to introduce himself. We like to keep it informal here. We want to get to know everybody. If you're comfortable, of course, not to put anyone on the spot. The no, monitor was, was this here. planned or because I just looked in my email today and saw this come up and I was like I didn't remember seeing it and I don't know if this is something you do on on a regular great question so I had some free time I had a couple of cancellations and then Sydney had some openings in her schedule and I thought at midnight when I couldn't sleep the other night, I was like, oh, let's do a webinar. Why not? Um, so I don't, we don't tend to offer regular free webinars we have in the past, but um, we do tend to do paid ones. So in the last summer I did multiple webinars. They were $14.99. You got the recording. They were really great. Everybody got to meet one another. We talked about building, you know, basically meal prep. We talked about egg bake, yogurt parfaits. How do you really assemble, you know, food for four to six people or larger families on a budget? So those were some really great webinars, but we don't tend to do very many free ones. So it's good that people are on it. It was very last minute but if people request them and really start to engage with us we'll probably start offering more but uh we do really have you know we have a great platform of lots of free resources so as you know it's hard to get on a call um with so many folks but we do our best for sure well thank you very much of course thanks for coming let's go ahead and let's get started so as always, super informal here. So I'm Wendy Rolbeck. I know that you know who I am, but I always like to introduce if I haven't met people and it's it's good to see your faces and Coach Sydney's going to be moderating. She's going to be handling. If you have any questions, go ahead and just type them in the question box. And then at the end of the slides, you know, we're just going to go through things together. You can either ask them or you can have Sydney ask them and then we'll just go through them with you. Again, super informal. So this is not like a conference hall where it's uncomfortable if you have an immediate question, you're like, well, I, that doesn't make sense. Just go ahead and literally just say something. And then we can probably talk about it as a group, because if you have it, most likely someone else has the same question. And we're going to go through creatine monohydrate because I get so many questions on that. So I really want to be very clear in what creatine is, what it does. Is it safe for teen athletes? Yes, uh, but I'm going to provide the science and then some healthy eating tips, grocery shopping staples. Everything is so expensive right now um, and being healthy is a challenge, but it's not impossible. So I, I really want to provide some empowerment and encouragement with some of the tips and tools out there that you can do. And we're going to go ahead and jump right into it if my computer will function. There we go. Okay. So I don't know if anybody is a Will or a Tommy Boy fan or Chris Farley. I thought he was hilarious. So coaches, whenever I present, they get a kick out of this. But um, parents, doctors, pretty much anyone that just doesn't understand what the function and structure of creatine is, will consider it a steroid. And we make this joke just because it's not a steroid, but it has steroid-like properties. So typically most kids will laugh about this, but creatine is fantastic in the sense that it can help you recycle ATP. It can help reduce muscle soreness. It can help you recover faster. It can help you add lean mass. We have creatine um, within our body that we produce naturally, but technically, Technically, right with the ATP being the cell's energy currency um, and our ability to convert that into ADP and then back to ATP. So without getting too sciencey, what you need to know is that we don't consume enough in our dietary sources, which is why most people will supplement with creatine monohydrate. And I have uh, several slides on the science and the mechanism of action at the end, um, but I just wanted to hopefully get you laughing a little bit. And there's just a lot of misconceptions out there that really create barriers for us to get healthier, um, to grow as far as being an athlete and just making choices that support the future that we're trying to create. And I think a common stigma is that you can't eat well on a budget, but you really can, right? Um, and we're going to provide some tips on how you can do that. And same thing with fruit. 
you know, fruit is very healthy. It's full of nutrition. Unfortunately, there's a lot of folks out there, even dietitians, unfortunately, doctors that will demonize sugar. Um, and we need our brain and muscle rely upon sugar for fuel, right? And the difference is that apple versus a candy bar they're both going to provide sugar. Sugar is digested the exact same way. It's just that with that apple, you're getting a surplus of nutrients. You're getting antioxidants, vitamin C, you're getting fiber versus the candy bar. It's just straight sugar. So you're not getting all those nutrients. So I do, and Sydney's the same way when we coach clients, we believe all foods fit. And we believe that, you know, understanding there's a certain nutrient profile of the foods that we choose, that's going to help us gain lean muscle, you know, you can't eat potato chips uh, versus an egg, right? And get the same result because that egg is going to provide you with leucine and eggs are really expensive right now. Um, but <laughs> there are some things that we can do, you know, buying those in bulk. So I'm going to skip ahead here. Computer seems to keep freezing on those sides. So these are a couple of sides. You've probably seen these because you follow us. And I really like this. Uh, we have a great grocery list. I did include it in this slide, but it is uh, tagged at the top of my Instagram profile, what you can do, you know, protein, carbs, fats, basically a healthy grocery list, but this right here, fueling elite performance. And this is for not just athletes, but us workday warriors too. people like Jeremy, people like Ann, Sydney, myself, we're not competing at the high school or collegiate level anymore, but these are very nutrient dense foods that we can eat more of, right. And focusing on eating less of some of these other items. And there's the argument out there that, you know, candy, and cookies and crackers, these all cost less. And I would argue um, that's not true because if you look at the investment in your health, dentist, uh, your DDS, he would also probably tell you different with the sugar, the decay that occurs. People spend thousands of dollars at the dentist when they're chronically consuming um, low nutrient dense foods and overly processed foods that are high in sugar. So you're spending a lot at the dentist. And then obviously there's long-term consequences of that uh, repercussions with your health, increasing insulin sensitivity, um, gaining weight, um, and also just having high blood pressure as well. So being on medications, those costs will add up. You may not see the immediate effect, but over time, you could be looking at spending thousands of dollars on medications for things you um, could have prevented by eating properly and eating those nutrient dense foods. So I think the balance is the most important thing and finding, you know, going to Aldi, going to even Walmart, Publix, uh, Meyer, depending on where you're oriented, you don't have to buy organic. I don't believe anyone needs to buy organic. I think it's great if you want to do that, but we know that fresh, frozen, canned, we can still be very healthy. And in fact, frozen fruits and vegetables actually retain their nutrient value um, better because they haven't been exposed to light, heat, oxygen, that transportation from farm, store, and everything in between. So canned goods too, if you get low sodium, you could also rinse You know, any legumes, chickpeas, things like that. You can get low sodium. That's a fantastic way to actually save money. Tuna packets, canned uh, chicken, salmon. Starkiss makes a great brand. You can get those in bulk as well. That's a great way to save money. And they're portable for athletes, which is awesome. Uh, Sydney, do you want to check any of the, the chat box here? Or did you? Yes. Uh, so far, there's no questions right now. Um, but anyone's welcome to put where they're from. I know Felicia was recently joined us. And so if you want to share where you're from or any questions, I'm monitoring the chat throughout this presentation. So awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Sometimes I'm like, I wish that would go with this little things in the way. Um, so, but I want to see your faces. So we'll just do this for right now and you'll say something. So this performance plate, you've probably seen this. I've also uh, modified this to meet for adults. Like if, if an adult wants to lose body fat, right, the portion of the whole grains will change because whole grains provide more carbs, right? More energy. And if we're not as active, we don't need as much energy, but athletes need half the plate to be whole grains, carbohydrates, because they have higher energy needs. They are playing multiple sports. They're growing and developing their body. They're going through the, you know, the growth development maturation, the Tanner stages, even until they're 25 years old. So, and having a couple of boys playing baseball, they would need their plate to look like this because it's going to offer their bodies what they need, the carbs, protein, the fruit and vegetable. And obviously 
colorful plate is a healthy plate. And if we really dissected this plate, we could say up in that whole grain category, the bagels, whether they be white, which is appropriate around training because you don't want fiber, you want it to break down very quickly. Um, but typically we do want to choose whole grain, but bagels are very low cost. Pitas, wraps, tortillas, super low cost. Not to say they're cheap, but in comparison to a lot of items, they are a lower cost food and you can buy those in bulk and you could save money and you can actually take those wraps, tortillas, English muffins, bagels, you can create an assembly line of peanut butter and jellies. And then you can also make turkey cheese sandwiches. You can make egg cheese bagel sandwiches. You can wrap these up in tin foil, put them in the fridge, put them in the freezer, pull them out later, and then reheat them. And you can, as a family, make basically your own breakfast sandwiches, your breakfast burritos. You can create an entire assembly line for breakfast, for the whole household, based on what your needs are. And very budget friendly, because if a person goes out to breakfast, they're going to be spending, you know, almost $15, even fast food. Now it's, I watched a video the other day of someone going through the McDonald's drive through for their English McMuffin. <laughs> it was like $15. So they also had like a milk and then I think they got a yogurt. So the reason why I bring that up is that I was at Walmart this morning and just to look at the yogurt prices. So a single, if you buy in bulk, obviously it's going to be cheaper, but if you bought a single serving great value yogurt, it was about 79 cents. So obviously location, this is Nashville, Tennessee. Um, it was one of the Southern um, Walmart. So it might be different where you're at, but that's still like seven, that's less than a dollar. Then you buy, you know, some berries, berries are very expensive, but if you get them on sale or you use frozen, you can add some berries to a yogurt parfait. Again, putting these things into mason jars, and everybody in the household can just grab out of the fridge. You're basically creating your own restaurant, a salad bar, an assembly line of meals and snacks. Um, and, and having those things is really, really important so that you're not having to stop and grab something on the way out or to and fro. Packing a cooler always is a good way to save money and time too. With the items that you did the meal prep on together, and another uh, component of just this plate in general is just having a balanced plate, right? Three meals to four meals every single day with these critical components. You don't have to worry about calculating calories or macros. If you fundamentally ate according to this plate, looking in terms of portion size, like fist or deck of cards, a mouse being a chicken breast. Whoops. <clears throat> we were talking about that slide. So the portions, the reason why I say this is because if we're working with a 12 year old athlete, sure, he could crack in my fitness pal. Kids are very savvy with electronics, but they don't have time. And I would rather them not spend all their time tracking if we can comfortably use the plate and they can say breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I'm going to meet all the needs here that I have without having to worry about tracking or counting calories. Obviously, if you have a, a gain lean mass or lose weight goal, that's a little bit different because we've got to have a calorie deficit or a calorie surplus, right? There, there has to be some sort of measurement there in order to assess progress. But fundamentally, most people are not eating three balanced meals like this. They're eating snacks throughout the day. They're skipping breakfast, which it's not the most important meal because all meals matter. In fact, research supports adults that eat breakfast, a higher protein breakfast, actually have a healthier waistline. They tend to be less prone to disease and less likely to develop type 2 diabetes. So your breakfast is not the most important meal, but front-loading your calories at breakfast does prove in the literature to be a healthier option. And especially our teen athletes, when they skip breakfast, they're a higher risk for nutrient deficiencies, B12, calcium, vitamin D, all of which are critical for energy, um, metabolism and bone health, obviously, which girls stress fractures, same thing with boys though, if they're not consuming sufficient dietary calcium, vitamin D, they're going to leach that from their bones. And then we have fractures, breaks, injuries, et cetera. But for the folks that do love the numbers, these are simple parameters for you that 20 to 30 grams of protein, 30 to 40 grams for boys. And I know that these numbers likely seem high, but <laughs> as you know, I'm a little bit of a rogue dietitian. Um, I wouldn't say rogue in the sense though, if you actually read the science, you would be on the same page as me and Sydney, because we believe the ISSN, they're position stand papers, they have published significant data to support higher protein diet and the fact that the RDA is too low. So 
I have not had any issues ever recommending three times the RDA for protein because athletes need it. They break down their muscle tissue. They're also trying to build up right their muscle after training sessions while being growing, developing. And then we also have the aging population, anyone over the age of 30, which includes me um, and pretty much anyone else on this call except for a few, uh, you are also fighting off sarcopenia age-related muscle loss. It occurs more rapidly with every decade. So in your 40s, you're looking at, for men, 8% loss, um, and it gets worse and worse. So if we eat more protein, we focus on our resistance training consistently, doing these basic things, we are going to reduce our risk. So as I had mentioned, I verbally just blasted off a lot of lower-cost uh, nutrient-dense foods. The Obviously, the eggs have changed. I do believe that all the other items though on here are relatively low cost. Again, everything is expensive. Food costs have gone up, but again, controlling our controllables, we have to eat. So making the informed decision is going to be picking up these items that if we go to Costco, we go to any type of grocery store, let's get the rotisserie chicken. Let's get the tuna packets. Let's try and, you know, purchase anything that we can in bulk. Cottage cheese, super nutrient dense high in leucine, which is the number one driver for muscle protein synthesis, buying that cottage cheese and then being able to portion it out, same thing with the yogurt, that's going to be a great option, great for uh, snack or before bed as well. Fruits and vegetables, like I said, does not matter if it's fresh frozen. I think most people would actually fare off if they fare off better if they did frozen just because people are so busy. And frozen, you can always let them thaw. You can put them into smoothies. Same thing with vegetables. You can put you know, spinach that's about to go bad. You can put it in the freezer and put that into smoothies. And you can blend that up. You can make smoothie ice cubes. You've probably seen that on my social media, but you can make yogurt, fruit, vegetable, ice cubes, put those into a smoothie with chocolate milk, which is you know, dairy is very nutrient dense, calcium, vitamin D, protein. It is a lower cost item. If you do fair life, obviously a little bit more, but these are all things that we can utilize in building that plate appropriately to be healthy and support good energy. So healthy snacks, these are, you know, a couple of pairings that I've already talked about that you've likely seen also on social media, turkey cheese sandwiches, peanut butter, jellies, almond butter uh, sandwiches are fantastic put some sliced banana on there. This is where I say like consistency and back to the basics are things that I wish more people would do uh, just because you can create a very decent menu without a lot of planning. If you just think like, all right, staples are chicken, turkey. If you are plant-based, obviously you could do tofu, you could do chickpeas. How can we portion these things out? Let's make sure we make enough in bulk and have that, you know, once a week, you're going to go to the grocery store. You're going to get what's on your list and only you and your family can decide what you really need using these items. But you can make your own bento boxes. You can make your own parfaits. You can do waffles. You can add peanut butter and honey and serve that with a hard boiled egg. I mean, super nutrient dense. And this we baby- have this... some questions if you want them now. Sure, sure. Let's okay. look at these. Perfect. So Jeremy was asking about portion sizes for the plate method meaning like is the protein on the plate if it's a quarter is that like four ounces or what what he's looking at there and like for veggies is that about a cup um so that's yeah great question. great question so this is where context is key so if we were looking at the usda and what they recommend they're going to say that a portion of protein <laughs> is three ounces i'm going to say my athlete's plate like we talk to athletes or you're getting this information four to six ounces. So that's where I say the deck of cards. Um, this mouse is probably going to be about three ounces. But I think that, you know, without splitting hairs, Jeremy, it's a great question. But if you use that plate, if you use a normal size 10 to 12 inch plate, um, which are bigger than what they used to be, used to be eight inches, you're going to get in a solid four to six ounces of that chicken breast of that uh, turkey. If you're doing salmon, I would actually reduce that. Salmon is a uh, higher fat. It's a great source of protein too, but I wouldn't do six ounces of salmon. I would do three ounces of salmon. But as far as the plate, same thing. Yeah. The, the fourth of the plate with the, the vegetables is going to be about half a cup. And then the carbohydrates. I mean, most meals, right? I just, you know, it's a great question, Jeremy, but I really just want people to say, hey, are we even eating are we even eating every uh, portion of the plate? Because most people are like either just carbs and protein or just healthy fats and protein. Everybody needs one serving. So if you look at it this way and you have a nice balance, half a cup of vegetables or a cup, there's discrepancies because 
cooked versus raw. I mean, we can really get into the trees with it, but what you need to know is about a half a cup of broccoli, according to the American Heart Association. And then, you know, banana would technically be a half of a banana. So every fruit and vegetable has different serving sizes. I think that the, um, the, the key thing to take away from this is portion of your protein at a bare minimum should be four ounces. Okay. And then whole grains, if you're, you know, an adult, you want to really figure out if you need a portion, a fourth of that, or if it's a teen athlete or a collegiate athlete, half of the portion of whole grains. So it'd be two slices of toast, uh, two waffles, two bagels, rice, not a whole um, plate of rice, right? Portions like a cup of rice. And then you could also do a sweet potato that could be a starchy uh, vegetable too. So whole grains, carbohydrates, but we also have carbs in our fruits and vegetables as well. So probably answered it and then some. Oh, thank you. Yeah. We also have Eric's question about how much nutritional value is lost steaming or boiling vegetables. And then he said, Frozen is a staple in his household. <laughs> I love that you asked this question, Eric, because steaming vegetables, so steaming them, like having the water, the boiling water beneath, and then you're steaming them, that's a much better option. Um, you are going to retain that nutrient value. Boiling, never boil your vegetables. Um, I see so many terrible things. I bet Sydney does too, on influencers that they're not registered dietitians. I'm not trying to pick on them, but kind of, because what they're doing is very damaging. They're boiling their broccoli, literally submerging it into a boiling pot. And then the water is green. They're like, oh, it's green. Like, yeah, <laughs> that's where all the nutrients are. So I don't know how like percent of nutrients that are lost, but it's darn near 90%. Um, and I would not recommend boiling your vegetables at all. I would recommend steaming, sauteing, baking, roasting, but the color, the pigment, that's the most important part. That's where all the nutrition is. So you want to, like when you're at the grocery store too, if you are picking out fresh, try and find the bell pepper that's at the bottom because it's going to be the most colorful. It's going to have the most uh, vitamin A, vitamin C in it, that luscious red or orange, green, et cetera, versus the one on top that's looking a little uh, discolored and a little dismembered. That's what I would recommend to the grocery store, but never boil, um, never ideal. Even Brussels sprouts, same thing. If you do want to boil or blanch them a little bit and then freeze them, there's some people that do that. I think even my Brussels sprout recipe, I boiled them um, during my dietetic internship. I built this recipe, but it's really tasty, the smashed Brussels sprouts. But we did boil them just very briefly just to soften them, but we didn't see, I mean, anytime I've done it, I have not seen a significant amount of the nutrients in the water because it was so quickly. It was or excuse me, the time limit that they were boiling was less than 30 seconds. So that's something if you want to soften things, like even people who boil potatoes, you could boil them, but they typically don't boil them for the full duration of cooking. They'll just do it to quickly soften them. So you're not losing a significant value like you are if you're going to boil them for the entire duration. Perfect. I don't know if you ever, if you had to do that during your uh, like food science Days. Yeah. <laughs> you learn that. Great memories. Mm. The spinach. Do you remember that one? Did you do that one? I, I think it was like broccoli or something like that. Did I think, broccoli? I think we did. Yeah. You must have had more money than us at UW Stout in Wisconsin. <laughs> Uh, so just real quick to reiterate, uh, when people tell me that it costs a lot too to gain weight, actually not necessarily. So turkey bacon, regular bacon, I don't demonize, you know, bacon. And I do believe though, that you should limit saturated fat. So if you have the peanut butter plus the eggs, and then we did bacon, regular bacon, I would recommend doing turkey bacon, but turkey bacon, couple of eggs, you have some peanut butter, three pieces of toast, some berries or fruit, and then you have whole milk. Super easy way if you, especially for Anne who has two baseball boys, this will be a great breakfast for them and super easy to cook because you can literally cook eggs, eggs in the microwave. You can toast your toast and your berries and even turkey bacon you can cook also in the microwave. I don't recommend it, but just kids can, it's a simple way, it's a safer way for younger kids to still cook these things. And the meal prepping, we did talk about this. So I want to make sure we get to the creatine, but you've seen this before. This is just really important. Like even for adults, you need to eat, you know, 
a good flow of meals as well to prevent. Technically, if we front load our calories as the day progresses, we consume less than we sleep better. Um, as athletes, they need to still be eating a good flow throughout the day. But as adults that are less active, we burn less calories. We are not growing and developing a body anymore. Our resting metabolic rate is not as high as theirs. So we really don't need to be consuming excess calories in the evening. And I think that's where a lot of folks get into trouble with being healthy and they're snacking. And then they don't wake up hungry for breakfast is because they've skipped meals throughout the day. And then they eat less than desirable foods at night. And then it impacts their sleep. And then the cycle repeats, they wake up the next day. So I used to have that happen to me before I knew anything about nutrition and I'm still learning, but I know that the, the most important thing is really uh, powering up your day with protein and produce. And that's very, very important. So I did say that I would briefly talk about this just for folks that did want to know, like, Hey, how would I really structure this? So especially and your boys for carbohydrates, I don't know anything about their biometrics, um, or how active or what their weight, et cetera. But what I would say is that they definitely need to be eating at least, you know, three to 400 grams of carbohydrates as uh, baseball players. There's a lot of baseball athletes that have quite a bit of conditioning, especially the ones that I've worked with. They are training pretty high um, and, and intense at, even in the off season. So kids are, kids are training very different than when I was in high school or even in college. And I know Sydney is um, a little bit more fresh out of college than I am. And she's an all American. She's amazing. And she actually wrote a couple of really good blogs too on the website. You'll have to read those um, all American tips from her really good blog. But kids need to eat. They need to eat enough. And this is the way to do it. You know, getting in enough protein. These recommendations are based on the American college of sports medicine, and then the um, Academy of nutrition, and then the dietitians of Canada, they have their recommendations, but then as you know, the ISSN, they recommend 1.6 to 2.0 grams per kilogram. So I put all that out here just because there's so many different governing bodies that you could look at for recommendations. That's why I really like the plate and that more activity equals more food, greater portions. So sometimes, right, I'll tell my athletes two breakfasts, right, two snacks, two dinners, two lunches, especially if they're trying to gain lean mass, which you've likely seen these two, but fundamentally, the breakfast burritos, the overnight oats, the trail mix, blending up banana, peanut butter, oatmeal, chocolate milk in a blender is a really easy way to gain lean mass if you are training, of course, and you're using those calories, but on a budget as well. So chocolate milk, if you did the True Moo, um, depending on who your dairy producer is, the store-bought brand is fine. I like Fairlife, obviously, because it's lactose-free and it is uh, more well tolerated amongst a lot of individuals. There's less, there's just less, uh, additives in it, but not technically in comparison to just good old fashioned dairy milk. Um, and the reason why I say that is I know milk as cow's milk, but unfortunately society knows it as all milk is all milk, but it's a plant-based alternative. So soy milk is not the same thing. Uh, coconut milk, almond milk, those are all plant-based alternatives. I would say soy milk has the most protein out of all the uh, plant-based alternatives. Almond milk's only going to have one gram. So there's a ton of additives in it and it's always more expensive. So I would not, people tell me that they try to buy almond milk to be healthier and then save money, which is completely counterintuitive because if you actually look at the price, you look at the label, at the store, I've taken clients to the grocery store and I've said, look at these labels, look at the price and how much protein are you getting here? How much calcium are you getting here? Um, you know, and they're looking at these things and they're like, well, wait a second, I'm getting eight times more protein here, more calcium, more vitamin D, there's less ingredients. It's cheaper than this almond milk. Why am I buying this almond milk? And I'm like, I don't know. It's a good question, right? So reading labels is very, very important. So I think that that's a, a super helpful thing to do. So a couple of things on this, I just gas station gainers. When you go to the gas station, right, you're in a pinch, it's going to cost you more money. So that's why I, I, I say avoid it at all costs. But if you have to, you've got to eat something and you need to be healthy with your choices as we should be, because we want to be healthy and less prone to disease. I'd recommend they always have fruit. They have, you know, but bananas, pears, apples, grapes. They have most gas stations. And even one that I was recently at in Alabama had, um, it was a very interesting 
it was a very interesting setup because they had so much. I was like, wow, you could literally get, you know, all servings of fruits and vegetables here. They even had carrot sticks, they had celery, and it wasn't the nicest gas station, not to pick on them, but it was a convenience store that you really wouldn't think would have a lot of options. So if they have it, I know all the, the high-end gas stations are going to have these options too. We just got to slow down and just take that time to look. But I do recommend planning ahead. But if you do go to the gas station, they have hard-boiled eggs, they have the core powers, they have trail mix, they have yogurt, jerky, um, and all those items. So rice, beans, legumes, very, very low cost. So super easy, actually, like the chicken at Walmart is going to be way cheaper. Um, not that I'm saying buy low tier meat, but for folks, I would say I'd rather you eat that meat than no meat at all. So you can get a very large serving of chicken from either Costco or Walmart, um, and then cook that in bulk, obviously, so you can meal prep. And then for a kiddo that's trying to gain lean mass or someone who's trying to eat more calories, you can do the rice, you can do the vegetables, um, and you can make a very, very easy muscle gain meal. And you can obviously modify it to fit anyone in the family's needs but you're eating as a family. And I think that that's very, very important. And anyone who works with us, we really value the not only faith component, but family and eating as a family. So although everyone has different goals, they should still be able to eat the same food that was prepared by mom, dad, or the guardian, um, and then enjoying that meal together because food is culture and having a healthy relationship with food is very, very important. All right, we're going to kind of skip over that recovery stuff. So snacking. Everyone's a snacker, which is a good thing, but we want to make sure that we focus on the good snacks. So again, budget-friendly snacks. Carrots are very low-cost celery. Hummus is a good choice if you can obviously buy things in bulk. Yogurt, I want everyone to make their own parfaits. They do have pre-made parfaits. I would not recommend always getting the pre-made parfaits. If you read the label, I did a video on it. I saw there was like 700 calories in it. I was like, this parfait is marketed as healthy, but it looks like a McFlurry from McDonald's. So you really have to read labels and you have to discern what's in there. You know, if there's added oats, if there's added sugar, is there maple syrup? You know, they are very overzealous with portions versus at home. If you make your own and you do these things in a mason jar, you're going to have more control. You're going to be able to save money. You're going to also be able to modify portions to appropriately fit your needs. So if you did the three-fourths cup of yogurt, you did a half cup of berries, you added a tablespoon of chia, um, maybe a teaspoon of honey, a little bit goes a long way. Um, little things like that can really make a big difference. And I have the veggie chips on there because there's a lot of families out there that just simply don't know uh, that those veggie straws are not the same thing is eating or carrots or fruit vegetables. So I have that on there just to share, like read the label. You'll see very quickly there's added oils, not that we demonize oils, but you're not getting the same nutrients that you would from having the actual carrots or even sweet potato fries. You can make your own at home. I highly recommend that. That's real quick. So if there are, I believe there was a strength coach. I think Felicia is a coach. Felicia, you still with us? I think Felicia's with us. Well, either way, she had said she had said that she is a strength coach. So that's great. So Felicia, this is for you. All the coaches I've worked with and I've helped build fueling stations on a budget are, you know, pretzel rods, banana, yogurt, chocolate milk, pure whey protein, if it's permissible, depending upon if you're at the college level um, or high school level. Sometimes parents are, you know, sending their kids off with stuff, but, and then just leaving it depends. There's so many different protocols at each school. I have some kids that can even leave food, like in a locker, we create a pantry. Nonetheless, Protein and carbs, post-training, that's the dynamic duo. Within 30 minutes, you want to have a minimum of 30 grams of uh, protein with 50 to 75 grams of carbohydrates. And of course, creatine, which we're going to talk about. Uh, but something is always better than nothing. Sometimes you don't have access to both protein and carbs. So we do applesauce, banana, chocolate milk, if you can. Most schools now are actually picking up on the fueling station thing and they're getting chocolate milk in their fridges. They're even getting fridges, string cheeses really, really helpful. And it's just a great way to support your athletes and help their recovery process. Post-workout meals are not the most important meal, just like breakfast is not the most important because all meals matter. But facilitating that recovery process as quickly as possible is one of the best things that you can do uh, to get the athlete started. And they're going to recept that nutrition 
much better. It's going to help reduce muscle soreness too. Okay. And I wanted to, I did a snippet. I love snippet. It's such a great tool from my Instagram. And I just want to share that this is a, a supplement safety graphic that is applicable to anyone. doesn't matter if you're an athlete or you're an adult. Any supplements that you use should be third-party tested. Very important because I could go create a supplement outside my condo and say, all right, cool, I'm going to sell this. And it could have gravel, it could have dirt, it could have rat poison in it. I would never do that. But supplements are regulated, but they are not as heavily regulated as our pharmaceutical. So there's some misinformation out there, even from dietitians that they say that supplements are completely unregulated. That is not true. They are regulated, just not as heavily regulated. So what that means is that I could create that supplement. I could sell it next week. And until somebody proves it's harmful, um, I could continue carrying out my business as such, right? So until that there's cause for concern. So that's very, very important. So you can go look that up on the USDA website because supplements are technically food. Uh, that's what they're they're claiming the mess. And I made a tweet about this too, um, that basically they are classified as food. So they're not going to be as heavily regulated. So pharmaceuticals, medications, those are very, very regulated. And obviously those cause a much larger liability. So that is why, but you want to, it's very easy to get a third party tested. You look up the NSF app, the informed choice approved. It's a free app. Um, no, I don't have a relationship with them, but I'm a sports dietitian and my athletes are going to use supplements. So it's why I empower them to say, all right, I don't want you using a pre-workout. I'd rather you eat real food, but if you're going to do it, I'd rather you not, but at least make sure it's third party tested. At least get that, you know, BSCG, omega, you know, multivitamin, fish oil, vitamin D, whatever it is, whey protein powder, NSF certified sport, informed choice approved. It's been free of any banned substances, which sometimes college athletes, it's your liability on the line, right? High school, same thing. You have this stuff in your system, you get tested. Maybe you're going to enter a, a showcase or a camp. Um, Elite hockey players, sometimes they're getting tested for some of these things. That's the whole thing is that your safety, number one, is the most important thing. Um, and you should want to use a regulated supplement that is third-party tested. So that's that's the most important thing is finding one that works well for you. Is there any questions on this? It's kind of a, a wild, wild west with the supplement industry because I delivered a presentation to a football program in Michigan a couple of weeks ago and they were asking about collagen. And I was just saying, yeah, collagen is like, it's low quality connective tissue. It's uh, only eight of the nine essential amino acids are found in collagen. So it's funny because collagen is so trendy and it's expensive and you're not even getting all the amino acids. So why wouldn't you eat, you know, chicken, beef, steak, eggs, they're expensive. But my point is, food first, because food is going to provide you with what you need. It's going to give you more nutrients than a supplement. A supplement is meant to supplement the gaps, right? And it's like basically trying to put a band-aid over a leaking dam. It's not going to work and it's ridiculous. And it's just um, like rearranging furniture on a sinking ship, which is why we talked about the breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks in between. And now we can talk about creatine and that it is literally like the icing on the cake without the cake really don't need the icing. So I specifically want to, as always, we know that it's been widely tested, widely studied, very, very well understood within the adult population, but youth athletes, those under the age of 18, infants, is it safe? Yes. There's the reason why I can confidently say that is it's not my opinion. I have read so many studies. I've read through all the literature. There's position stand papers from some of the most brilliant scientists in the country and internationally, the UK, Canada, they have not found any reported adverse effects to date, even in infants less than six months old. And because it's three amino acids, arginine, glycine, methionine, and it is not a steroid, it will not harm your kidneys, it will not harm your bones, it will not make you fat. Like I said in the beginning of this presentation, it helps you recycle ATP, which is the cell's energy currency. And the reason why that's important, right, is if we're an athlete, we're a person that cares about functioning, we have a beating pulse, ATP is our energy currency. Currency, we need that. So if we can recycle that more effectively as an athlete, 
or a person um, cognitively, neuroprotection wise, there's so many benefits to using creatine because of that. So we're getting speed, power improvements, strength, right? Even your focus, your concentration, your cognitive function, it is safe, it's effective. I used to be reluctant about two years ago. I had an epiphany. I was like, well, there's nothing in the studies that say that it's harmful. And like, this is the structure, this is the function. Why wouldn't I recommend something that can help someone be healthier, bigger, stronger, faster? And then obviously, you know, I don't have any skin in the game. I don't have any correlation with any companies. I just know that it's helped our athletes. It's helped myself. It's helped family members. I didn't have uh, my older adults over the age of 60. They're using creatine because of the older uh, population that is experiencing a lot of great effects as well too, from a disease reduction standpoint. So health wellness because of that ATP, because of your ability to maintain lean mass, to fight off sarcopenia even, right? Because more muscle equals better bone health, right? So this is something that is so misunderstood. And I just, it's wild to me because people will literally give their kids, but they just don't know, but like really, really toxic things, um, like in fried foods, which is, you know, a toxin or even alcohol when people are drinking alcohol, but they're like, no, I can't use creatine when alcohol is literally a poison, but creatine monohydrate is literally amino acids that are found in, you know, beef, chicken, fish, steak, but we can't consume enough dietary creatine to sufficiently increase our intramuscular creatine stores, <clears throat> which is why we have to supplement. We don't have to, but we should. And this is how you do it. I'm losing my voice. <laughs> Lots of talking today. So three to five grams per day, career post. And something that's misunderstood is that, you know, it's best pre or it's best post. Technically, the research has mostly studied post-workout and the benefits too is that you're having your protein, your calf, or excuse me, your protein carbohydrate, and then you're drawing it into the cell more efficiently. Um, but pre-workout on a rest day, any time of day, as long as you use creatine, three to five grams, powder pill, does not matter. Um, again, these are third-party tested ones I recommend. You can use any third-party tested. These are just the six because it's easy, but there's a laundry list that you can look at on the app. But I would not recommend using caffeine with your creatine because they do compete. And if it happens every now and then, and not a big deal, but chronically using both together pre-workout um, is not ideal because it will reduce the absorption. So that's why I recommend post-workout, bring it with you or on a rest day, have it whenever in the afternoon when you're having a yogurt parfait, mix it into a smoothie, mix it into yogurt, take it with you on the go. Um, just take it, right? That's all that really matters. Don't put it in your shaker bottle at the bottom and have it all settle in cold water. So it's good to mix into yogurt. You can put it in oatmeal, you can put it to a smoothie, blend it up so that you're actually endogenously consuming it and it ends up in your body, right? And I have this little disclaimer here down at the bottom, um, just with that competition, you know, creatine, caffeine, you don't want to consume them together. Granted, caffeine does have great uh, performance, you know, benefits, right? for cognitive function and also just reducing our fatigue risk. So these are, these are basically just the benefits I summarize, the recovery, the reduction in injury. Um, there's zero evidence to support that it's harmful to, to teen athletes, to kids, does not matter. Uh, the age, the sport, the gender, everybody should be using creatine if you have a beating pulse. And yes, I put my credentials on the line because I believe in science and the research has not reported any harmful effects. So parents, you can use creatine. Obviously, I want you to focus on getting your kids to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner with snacks, but creatine is very low cost. It's not going to cost you a lot of money and it's going to make a pretty significant impact on health performance and longevity. So super secret for success literally everything we talked about tonight. So if people actually applied the, the protein, the carbs, the recommendations, you know, drinking enough fluid, getting enough rest, we can talk about sleep because that could be a whole nother webinar, but they did these things, they'd be successful. It's just that a lot of people struggle with consistency. They struggle with knowing what to do, how to do it. And I think that's where, you know, really the coaching comes into play of having somebody to walk you through guide you through, Hey, this is how we're going to implement more protein at breakfast. This is how we're going to implement additional carbohydrates between meals. This is how we can gain lean mass. This is how we can effectively get creatine into the system. You know, loading is unnecessary. Um, all those things are really, you know, 
fairly easy when we think about them, but executing them is really hard because it can kind of be overwhelming. So that's where it's beneficial to, you know, work with us, whether it be in our student athlete coaching program or getting a, a team talk for your strength coaches, for your athletes, for parents, for, for anyone, right? We even have family nutrition coaching and coach Sydney has been doing a terrific job leading so many families on the path of eating more protein, getting in more fruits and vegetables, making sure that their needs are being met on a budget. So I'm going to open it up here to uh, more questions. If anyone has any, Sydney, you've been doing a great job of letting us know. No new questions, questions. in the chat right now, other than um, someone asked about where you, oh, Anne asked about where you find the blog. So I put in the website. If you haven't checked out the chat, you can see the website. And if you explore that, there's many, many uh, resources on there. But if you check out the resources, that's where you'll find the blogs under. Can everyone see my screen? I'm going to change it over here to the, okay. to our website. So this is the website and it's beautiful. Um, I have folks in Michigan that have worked on it and they're incredible people because I used to live in East Lansing, Michigan, and I love supporting small businesses. So this is the, the website. A lot of folks don't know about it. They just follow Twitter, which is perfectly fine. But just so you know, we have dietitian partnership services. We work with um, club programs, track and field. We work with baseball, basketball, football, swim, all sports. So all of our, our resources, there's presentation guidebooks. You can purchase pre-recorded talks. I also have a ton of recipes. Sydney has been contributing some recipes. She joined our team in April and there's podcasts. So the blogs is where we were uh, just discussing in the chat there. So Craving sugar, that was a popular one, but Sydney's uh, All American Tips that I had referenced is right here. That's a fantastic blog. They're they're short and sweet too, right? You're not going to be, you know, you're not going to sit there for an hour and have to read through these things. You're going to get what you need um, because it's bulleted. It's really easy to follow. And Sydney also wrote one about gut health. And um, a very popular one too is just what to eat the night before a game day, staying hydrated, food freedom. You know, all of these things are are things that I've, you know, authored over time and now Sydney's contributing as well, but things that have worked well for our athletes, for our clients. I also, we work with healthy adults too. So some of these articles as well, like creatine for, for women and even healthy lifestyle coaching, um, tons of tons of content on here. Breakfast people ask all the time, what do I eat for breakfast? And I've literally provided um, this is an older blog, but I wrote down so many ideas and you could just print this baby out and you could be set for life. There's a lot of really good stuff on there. We also have our testimonials. You can go check out and see, you know, football players, uh, cross country athletes, some parents too that Cheryl uh, Famuluk out of Michigan, her husband, I met him at uh, Ferris State in Northern Michigan when I presented to the hockey program and ended up working with her daughter. She was one of my first athletes when I officially started my business and she now plays at UW Milwaukee and she's amazing and they're great people but that's the thing um about working with nutrition with Wendy and why I'm, I'm so passionate as you all know on Twitter and, and social media is I love helping people um I know that Sydney loves helping people too and that's why I hired her she shares a very similar philosophy set of morals and values that we put people first and you know, Jesus Christ, I give all glory to him because this business, this, this platform exists because of him. And he put the passion in my heart to get out there and, and talk about these things as a young dietetic intern. And that's really what's built up the Twitter. But I just love, I love helping people. We're so glad that you could join us tonight. We hope that you found value in this and that you'll share any feedback with us on what you, you enjoyed, what you want to learn more about, or even share a, you know, call out on Twitter or Instagram, um, just letting us know that you've joined us tonight and what you found helpful. That would be so amazing of you. And we're just so grateful for your time tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. Does any, Anne, I know is Anne still with us? I know she yep. is working. We still have about five minutes. So if anybody has questions on anything or just any, it doesn't have to be just about what we talked about, anything under the sun. You have the floor. 
I wanted to ask you a follow-up question about the the creatine and what you've seen for um, like digestive issues, thing, things like that. So. Mm -hmm. So this is a, I'm glad you asked this question. It's a fantastic question. People often contribute their GI distress to creatine when it's not the creatine, it's the source. A lot of kids, and I've even talked to professional baseball players um, and my college ball players out of California, they blame creatine for cramping, which creatine actually draws water into the cell. It helps with hydration. Um, the cramping or gut issues that people experience have zero to do with the creatine and it has everything to do with the fact that they took a creatine supplement plus a bang or a pre-workout, or they didn't drink enough water in general. Just like if I and ate a bunch of steak or chicken. I just crushed a meal, but I didn't drink any water. I would have a, I would have a tummy ache. I would feel well. Um, I would have some gut issues because water is required to not only digest, absorb, transport throughout the body. Um, but creatine, right. It does require more fluid because of the mechanism of action, just like carbohydrates, we need to drink enough fluid. So what I found in my experience, it's not just an N equals one or N equals two. This is proven in the literature as well. Like it does not cause any cramping or gut issues. It's the source. There's been several um, anecdotal evidence as well. Like people reporting they're using C4, they're using these pre-workouts, assaults, like the most ridiculous you know, they're just the names they come up with these pre-workouts are scary, uh, but they're using other artificial sweeteners. There's just other sources when combined with the creatine. So the second I get my athletes or anyone I work with communicate with, we're doing hundred percent creatine monohydrate with water, with the chocolate milk, real chocolate milk, not Nesquik or something else. Potentially they could bother their stomach. They're getting in enough fluid. They have no issues. They have issues when they just do a quick, the kids call it uh, dry, dry popping or dry, some dry thing that they do. And they just use that and then they don't drink any water. And of course you're going to get a stomach ache. We get headaches. If we don't drink enough water, we get dehydrated. So your question's fair. I would say that on a case to case basis, I'd like to ask more questions about why they're experiencing gut issues. Are they drinking enough water? What stress do they have? Um, are they going to and fro classes? Like what's going on in their lifestyle, because we secrete gastric acid when we're stressed out. Uh, we have different, you know, we have a, a certain pH that's met in our body, but also within our stomach too, that acid, that base is met to keep that balance and stress, our nervous system, hormones, things can come into play there. So it's not always just one thing. It's what else is going on here? What are we eating? How much are we drinking? How much did we sleep? And I think that that, you know, opens up a, a question that is it really the creatine or is it the fact that the person only drank 20 ounces of water that whole day? And they also, you know, had a bunch of caffeine or a bunch of acidic foods, like a bunch of tomatoes that there's so many things that we could unpack there, but I would uh, argue that it is not the creatine that's causing the gas bloating. It's the source. It's what, a, what other modalities are taking place that we need to account for. Thank you. I actually really appreciate that. And I'm going to kind of think of it through that lens um, a, a bit more and as I'm attempting to be a little more open-minded about it. So I, I hear you and I actually really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, that's so good. And just so you know, too, and I tell this to anyone, anyone that I present to or talk to, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm just here to say, hey, this is the research. This is what works really well. These, these are systems and things that you could do and you get to choose. It's your kiddo. It's, it's your family. You make all the decisions. I'm not here to tell anybody what to do, but if they do ask me like, hey, what does the science say? Well, it says this. What are the recommendations? Well, according to the science, these are the recommendations. There's been zero reported adverse effects. It's not harmful. Um, and that's up for you to decide what you want to do with the information. So I just love that you said that you're open-minded to it because if you have an open mind, that, that's great. It's, you know, myself included, if they came out and in 50 years and the research is finding that for whatever reason, uh, you know, kids are, are getting gut issues. They're having a, you know, 
ailment of some sort, which is not going to happen. I have to be careful what I say. This is not going to happen. But if they reported that, just like whey protein powders, if they're contaminated or something like that, um, then yeah, for sure. If that's what the research says, I'm going to change my mind because we should. We're scientists. We should always be questioning everything. So that's why I, I defer to the position stand papers within the ISSN. Um, Dr. Andrew Jagum, he's fantastic. He's based in La Crosse, Wisconsin. He and his lab, they're they're doing several creatine monohydrate and teen athlete papers right now. So I I would not worry because we have so many great research studies in the works right now and in Canada and in the UK that are assessing, they're, they're questioning, they're testing for these very things you're concerned about, which as you should as a parent, we should all be concerned. But I'm a big advocate for what does the current research say um, and then making the most informed decision with that. But I would change my mind if, if new available evidence surfaced. It hasn't yet, but I would. Speaking of water, but this is great. So we will look at doing another one of these and I would love, again, any feedback is always appreciated. You guys are fantastic. You know, it's a community and without everybody participating and supporting, we, we wouldn't be able to grow together. So thanks so much everyone for your time. And we will, you know, be in touch with you. If you want to send us an email, um, coach Sydney as well, she collected maybe some info from folks, if they have any follow-up that they desire. And I can also add in my email too, if you guys would oh. like to reach out that way individually. And we do have the, so the info at nutritionwithwendy.com, I believe that one's on the website too. So that would go to that admin email, but if Sydney's going to give you her direct email, I think that's awesome. I would take it. I would take her up on that. <laughs> so this is good. So everybody have an awesome night and stay blessed as always stay safe out there. And um, it's the weekend. So I hope everybody has a really blessed weekend.